Okay, I think it's uh, six or five, so we can start with this event. Let me share my screen. Here we go. Okay, welcome everybody uh, to this uh, WebEx event meeting uh, on artificial intelligence in oil and gas. Um, my name is Diego Rovetta. I'm the president of the local chapter Netherlands. But uh, tonight, uh, this uh, event uh, is uh, presented uh, to not only the uh, Netherlands audience, but uh, to much more than that. So we are welcoming also the local chapters of uh, London, Paris, Oslo, Aberdeen, together with some uh, student chapters from uh, Aachen and uh, also the dogs uh, from Delft, plus uh, all other people that are interested on, uh, on this specific topic. Uh, in my presentation, which is just the opening presentation, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the AGE and the local chapters. Uh, then uh, I will touch base the, uh, the topic of the evening, which is the artificial in intelligence in oil and gas. Uh, I will talk a little bit about the EAG and the involvement uh, of the Association on Artificial Intelligence, especially uh, introducing the uh, interest community on AI, uh, which is uh, a, a group uh, that uh, started in 2019 and uh, that is a uh, task is to focus exactly on artificial intelligence. Uh, the committee of, the, uh, of this uh, special interest community asked me also to, uh, to do a poll during this, uh, uh, this event. So I will ask you also to answer a few questions uh, during uh, my opening presentation. Then uh, I will go to the agenda of uh, today. Uh, I will introduce the speakers. I will give some uh, uh, house rules on uh, WebEx event. And then, of course, there will be uh, the presentation of the two uh, speakers of, uh, uh, of tonight. So the EAG, uh, European Association of Geoscientists and Engineers, uh, was uh, founded in 1951. And uh, it's a professional not-profit association of geoscientists and engineers. Uh, it's a worldwide association counting approximately 90,000 members at the moment. And uh, it operates uh, through two divisions, the oil and gas one and the near surface geoscience one. The way EAG is reaching uh, the local communities uh, is uh, uh, through affiliated societies, of course, but also through uh, the EAG local chapters. These are uh, active uh, scientific uh, local communities uh, that collaborate with the EAG uh, in order to promote uh, geoscience and engineering. Uh, they create uh, some interaction, gathering together uh, professionals, uh, both from uh, academia and industry. They are, of course, looking for talents and opportunities in the region where they are based. And, uh, of course, they are promoting scientific and social interaction in order to build up uh, not only a local but uh, even a global network. Uh, here you can see a map uh, of the world and all the uh, different points are uh, different local chapters. Uh, some of them are listed here. Uh, but uh, as I said before in this presentation, now I want also to welcome uh, the other local chapters that uh, have been invited. So this is local chapter Netherlands uh, together with uh, London, Paris, Oslo and Aberdeen. We are always looking for uh, uh, new members to join us. So you can find us on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, each local chapter uh, has his own uh, uh, web page on, uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, the special interest community on AI has also uh, a LinkedIn uh, page. And uh, of course, you can reach us also through uh, email at uh, uh, these addresses. Uh, again, we are always looking for new members uh, that are uh, uh, actively uh, participating to our uh, events and, uh, and uh, uh, organization in general. Now, uh, let's go to the topic of, uh, of this evening. We are talking about uh, AI in oil and gas. And uh, let me start with some uh, bullet points uh, that I got from a recent uh, paper uh, published on Business Wire last April uh, that is specifically talking about AI in the oil and gas industry with uh, some uh, forecast uh, on uh, uh, the next five years. 
Of course, the numbers that you see here and some of these treatments uh, were, uh, um, um, were done before the uh, COVID. So maybe uh, we have to take some of these numbers now uh, a little bit uh, with the cautions. But uh, uh, I think, I think uh, these are still valid points to make uh, uh, when we talk about AI in oil and gas. So the market uh, was valued last year about 2 billion US dollars and is expecting to grow uh, to up to about 4 billion by 2025. Uh, oil and gas uh, is uh, definitely uh, the most highly valued commodity in the energy sector. Uh, we had uh, a few talks uh, in the month of May and uh, in the month of June uh, together with the local chapter Paris on uh, decarbonization and energy transition. And all the speakers uh, were putting that, uh, were also um, admitting this point that even during the energy transition, oil and gas still remains one of the most highly valued commodity. Uh, OGA, uh, which is the Oil and Gas Authority, is already using AI to interpret data. Uh, running this uh, national data repository in UK that was launched in March 2019. And uh, also oil and gas company uh, are using AI uh, in data science uh, to make complex data, uh, especially related to exploration and production, more reachable. Um, also, uh, there is a general lack of a skilled AI professional on the market. Uh, a recent uh, poll is saying that uh, 56 of uh, uh, senior professionals in AI uh, are saying that there is a lack of other AI workers in the industry, and this could uh, delay a little bit uh, the, the growth uh, of the market. Many organizations across the world are trying to use AI uh, to um, uh, make the production processes more efficient and optimized and our industry uh, as well. And uh, many investments uh, by big players in this technology uh, are happening in these days. Some recent developments, for example, last October, uh, Microsoft, uh, in collaboration with Becker Hughes, uh, developed uh, Azure Cloud Computing Platform uh, on this topic, uh, making use of AI. Uh, last February, uh, Shell, um, started an online program that uh, teaches its employees about uh, artificial intelligence skills. And this is, of course, uh, um, due to the need to have more employees uh, uh, with the proper uh, AI expertise, but at the same time is uh, in order to cut the cost, uh, improve the business processes, and generate revenues. So this is uh, just a, a general introduction uh, about uh, AI in oil and gas uh, that is also explaining why also our organization, AAG, is interested in uh, having uh, uh, more and more AI in uh, conferences and workshops, and is also launching, uh, actually it was launched last year, a special interest community uh, dedicated to, to the uh, AI and the related application uh, focused on geoscience and engineering. Uh, special interest communities are basically professional networks uh, uh, working on uh, uh, a specific topic, and they usually share information and opportunities. Uh, they develop uh, activities and they expand the professional network. In particular, uh, the special interest community on uh, AI has a newsletter, and uh, this newsletter is uh, reporting some interesting information uh, about uh, the news from the community. Uh, some resources are shared as well, and you can find the name of the committee here and uh, uh, also the activities uh, 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 that may be of your interest. EAG is also um, advertising uh, one conference and one workshop that are happening uh, soon. The first one is uh, on uh, digitalization and uh, uh, it's called the EAG Digital. It will happen at the end of the year in uh, Austria, in Vienna. And uh, the deadline for submitting the abstract is the 15th of August. Uh, the other one is uh, the first EAG workshop on uh, optimization project turnaround performances. Uh, it will be next February in uh, London, 
and uh, uh, both of these conferences, of course, uh, are also related uh, to AI. So if you are interested, you can also have more information on, uh, uh, on the website of uh, EAG. So today's agenda is uh, at 630 all parties, a senior research geophysicist at Aramco, will talk about machine learning in seismic data processing. After his presentation, uh, Norbert Dolle, a managing partner at White Space Energy, will talk about from superhuman performance in games to augmented decision making in the real world. And uh, finally, at the very end, after the two talks, we will have uh, the Q&A session with some discussion. Let me introduce the first speaker tonight. Paul Svartis is a senior research physicist for Aramco Verse Company, working on AI applications for seismic data processing. Uh, he works as a geophysicist for Shell's Reservoir Surveillance R&D team from 2012 to 2018, and before as a seismic processor on all kinds of data in Oman and the Netherlands for Shell uh, between 2004 and 2012. Uh, he earned a PhD in Applied Physics from uh, Delft University of Technology and a Master of Science in Geophysics from Utrecht University. So please, Paul, uh, take the presentation uh, um, uh, ball here and uh, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you, Diego. Um, hello, everyone. It's kind of weird presenting to so many people and I see nobody. Um, well, let me um, put my presentation in full screen and then we can go. So uh, yeah, this talk on machine learning or AI or data science or any of those tools in data processing, seismic data processing. So that's a collaborative effort uh, from the people in, in our team in, um, in Aramco Research Center in Delft. And this has been uh, a work we started roughly two years, two or three years ago. So, uh, and today I'll, I'll share with you um, our thoughts on, uh, on how these tools could help us in processing and, and some results that we, uh, that we have obtained. Okay, so I don't know um, who's out there and what your level of expertise is, so I'll just go through some preliminary, some definitions first, and then uh, my thoughts on AI. So I might be wrong, will the future will tell, but... Um, Paul, so sorry to interrupt you, you're not sharing anything, so probably... Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. Uh, yes, I can fix that. Um, share my screen. Okay. Here we go. Right. Well, you haven't missed much except the first slide. Um, okay. So back to presentation mode. So, uh, like I said, my thoughts on on uh, how AI could help us, or or maybe not, and then some examples and some concluding remarks that might be uh, some food for discussion. So. Um, AI, artificial intelligence, uh, it's, a, it's a big term um, and it consists of many different things. So uh, typically AI is, is um, well, artificial intelligence could be grouped or could be categorized as, as like strong AI and, and, and weak AI and anything in between. And it seems like strong AI is, is where we want to hide uh, human level intelligence and as the machine gets smarter and smarter, I guess that uh, light blue circle would shrink and shrink. So the definition of strong AI is, uh, is changing over time. So these, these other forms of uh, AI are, are more where, you, where we get into like mathematical tools to, to derive information from data. Uh, and, and then we get into the machine learning. Uh, machine learning consists of many, many different algorithms, although the term machine learning uh, wasn't around, well, or maybe it was, I never heard of it when I was in university. But the techniques were certainly familiar. I mean, when you open a book on machine learning and you read about linear regression, then yeah, you realize, okay, maybe this is not everything here is, is very new. And then there's, of course, uh, deep learning, uh, the deep neural networks, which have also existed, but as, as you all know, the, um, the arrival of GPUs and advanced 
algorithm to solve the backpropagation and vanishing gradient problem have really opened up this uh, for wide use. So um, as you go you know, from the big circle to the, the smaller circle, you get really, really good at really, really narrow tasks also. So uh, seismic, I have to assume everybody's aware, but um, let's just go through it anyway. So we have acquisition, then we uh, have some data, then we do something called processing, uh, that's the black box, and out comes magically a nice image of the subsurface, which is then um, given to uh, people that know how to uh, extract geological information out of that. And then the, the, the process goes on and on. So in this talk, it's of course all about the black box. So most people are very happy to just leave that black box closed, uh, rightfully so. But if you open, you would probably find something like this. And if you are an, an expert or knowledgeable, you would recognize that this is uh, sort of, yeah, this, this is based on land seismic data processing. Um, so seismic processing is both a science and an art, which is a nice quote I picked up from Johannes Rehling. Um, it's a science, of course, because each one of these boxes is based on uh, hardcore physics or mathematics. But the way you string them together or which boxes you choose, which operations you want to apply to the data, that's, that, that's, um, that's more of an art form sometimes. Uh, it's not always clear what the right choice is. So you would have to rely on experience and gut feel and of course your training and uh, the desired outcome. So this can take quite a long time, six to 12 months is not uh, unheard of. And um, that's, that's really, really long. Um, so it takes so long, for instance, if you do all of those things by yourself, so if you're a one man team, then you have to do everything in, uh, yeah, yeah, one after the other. Or maybe if you can do it a bit more efficient or you have more people and, and really fast computers, you can start to think about uh, how can I plan this efficiently? And uh, maybe I can do things in parallel and then I can and reduce my uh, delivery time. And then if you get uh, really clever, you have uh, even more processors or more advanced algorithms, or you take some shortcuts, you, you end up where we are probably nowadays, where you have a fast track solution and you have things going on in parallel. And we try to squeeze those 12 months to six months or maybe even three months. Um, and, and this is, I think, an area where uh, artificial intelligence could really help us to reduce that delivery time even some more. So here are now some of my thoughts on how this could work. So I guess what many people feel, or, or maybe some, some people feel, is uh, that this is, uh, this is what AI can do, right? We throw in the seismic data, uh, we throw it into the black box, and magically out comes uh, seismic data. And I've certainly read some high-level papers that suggest that this is the way to go. Um, this is the holy grail of seismic processing, but unfortunately now probably also the processors know, yeah, nobody knows what's going on inside anymore. So maybe this is not such a desirable outcome. If that image on the right comes out and nobody really knows what happened or, or can explain what happened, then who wants to spend millions to drill a well on it? Um, also, that kind of thinking is it uh, makes me think of this graph, the Dunning-Kruger effect, that uh, the less you know, the more competent you are, or sorry, the more confidence you have that your <laughs> predictions are probably accurate. So, and on the extreme peak there, you probably have people saying that we can predict drill locations using only data and AI. And I, I don't know if that's true. Maybe it will be in uh, 10 or 20 years time. But um, I think also those predictions are made by people that have not been humbled by actually doing seismic data processing. So it's more likely that uh, that we end up with something on the far right where we have some really amazing breakthroughs that can help us with part of the problems. And I probably was somewhere on that really steep curve on the on the left uh, two or three years ago, and, and now I'm somewhere over the hill where I'm, mm, this is harder than I thought so, but um, definitely there are some things that are going to be really, really useful. So I think the, uh, the, the question to, to answer here is how can we reduce seismic processing time? So the other question you 
could ask yourself is how can we improve seismic processing quality? But I'm not so sure that that um, uh, AI is really going to play a very big part there. Um, again, I'd like to be proven wrong. So, the, the, what, so if you if you zoom in a little bit on on why processing takes so long, you realize that any of these uh, these nice little boxes uh, termed here or, or or depicted here on the right as any operation consists of um, you know typically three things. Um, the first is like the dark green where you are testing your parameters or trying out how to run the algorithm. Or, for instance, you have to pick lines or velocities, et cetera. So that's a significant human effort. And the other significant human effort is in checking whether your results are correct. Um, so it was supposed to do something, and I tested everything on, uh, on, that, on one particular line, but how is the result on any of the other lines? And then uh, yeah, the amount of CPU or GPU time it takes to run, that obviously varies. It's much faster for things like zero-facing, and it's very long for things like uh, least squares migration. So why AI in seismic processing? Um, well, I think it may actually, for some algorithms or some operations, uh, help us get to the center of this Venn diagram where we have something that is uh, both fast, simple, as well as good. Uh, fast, because once you've trained a uh, AI application to to do something, typically it executes in uh, in milliseconds, very very fast. Also, once you have trained such a thing, and there's very few parameters, and uh, yeah, how good it is that typically depends on the quality and quantity of your training data and how how well it resembles the actual data that you um, you want to apply your your AI solution on. So this also means uh, yeah the the training time that takes a long time. But if we can offload that uh, to off to, to basically off the critical path, then then yeah overall it might still take a very long time. But but the actual delivery could really benefit. We could for instance train all these network before we actually go out to do any data acquisition. So then um, still over the grand scheme, I think you still spend the time, but you get the product faster or, or shorter after you have acquired your, your final shot. So therefore, um, uh, we think that we could have two scenario, two workflows or two yeah, uh, grand schemes where AI could play a role. So the first is called AI, an AI supported workflow where we don't, throw away everything we ever had. We, we, <laughs> that typically meets a lot of resistance. If you go to a seismic processing team and say, we're now going to do everything different, you'll probably be met with quite some skepticism. But if you could actually help them with the tedious tasks of parameterization and QC, so those are the green boxes at the beginning and the end of the conventional programs, yeah, I think there you could, real, could really have a business impact. The, the other application is, is more an AI-driven processing workflow where, uh, let's say, neural networks do parts of the processing, so denoising, interpolation, maybe imaging. So this is really where we replace uh, our old and trusted algorithms with new. And that's going to take, of course, more time to, um, well, depending on the application, but you need to build up a level of trust. So in the examples I have in my slide deck are, are all from the, the AI driven where we actually use a neural network to do processing rather than the AI supported because uh, I find that that's a little bit more difficult to, to, uh, to move forward in. So why, why could this work? Well, if you studied the topic, you, you're probably familiar with some of these results. So these, these are all machine vision uh, problems. And here's a quote from Andrew Eng. Um, if you've taken any of the Coursera courses, you probably are familiar with him. And the statement was that pretty much anything a normal person can do in less than a second, we can now automate with AI. And I think also we can, we can change that statement now to any, um, anything that an expert can do in less than a second, we can now automate with AI. For instance, analyzing these, uh, these medical images, right? So, and um, if we can 
do all of these things, why can't we do some of these things, right? If we can analyze cats and dogs, why cannot we analyze uh, ground roll and, and guide weights and reflections? Or if we can pick the limbs of a, of a human being, why cannot we pick the velocities which typically exhibit a certain trend? Um, and, and these are really at the basis of, uh, of doing QC and doing parameter selection. So in order to, to, to move forward on that, you really need to solve this problem. The other one, um, so this is more the AI-driven uh, approach, is where we approximate, we, we use the, 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 the property of, for instance, neural networks that it, they can approximate any function. So if they can do that well, can they approximate a simple operation, like random noise attenuation? Uh, the answer is yes, we, I have an example of that. Uh, or can they uh, approximate a complex operation with lots of parameters? Can they, for instance, learn or replicate the results of, uh, of something like migration? Or can, they, can we use a neural network to bundle up a whole cascade of operations like is depicted here? And the reason I'm confident that can be done is because when you look, for instance, into, into what is going on in something like a convolutional neural network, you see that it's, it's filtering, it's convolutions, it's linear algebra, and it's optimization. And this is like the bread and butter of seismic data processing. So um, if any of you out there think that it might be challenging to, to move into this field, then don't worry. You'll probably find it easier than you think if you know about seismic data processing. Okay, um, having said that, all of that, let's go to uh, some examples. So I have three examples um, classified in these groups, machine vision, signal processing, and maybe something inversion related, parameter estimation. So this is, this is maybe the cats and dogs problem of, uh, of seismic data processing and AI. It's, it's probably the, the easiest program out there, uh, no disrespect to anybody that spent a year trying to get this to work, but um, it's basically you, 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 it's a supervised learning problem where you, you give it the solution and you train the network to predict the difference between uh, shot generated events and uh, everything else. Of course, the, the algorithm doesn't know that. It just tells, it does what you tell it to do. So why is this useful? It's uh, because there's a gazillion first break pickers out there already. Um, well, yeah, that's true, but they, you know, we still require human QC effort and there's still inconsistency in picks quite often. So here, the, the objective is to, to reduce costs, to reduce turnaround time again. So here are some results of, an, uh, of, of the work that uh, we had an intern student do in, in our office, Gil Fernout. Um, and this is based on a, uh, on a unit. Uh, most of the image processing applications in seismic data processing are done with units, I see. Um, and here, the, uh, the blue line is the, the reference first break, and the red line, uh, the predicted, or it's actually the boundary. It's actually a segmentation problem where you had classify every pixel uh, as being like above or below the first break line. And then the red line is simply the boundary between those. So it's very good, but it's not perfect always. You see here, there's some, some mismatches, but uh, it, it, it fits the good, fast, and simple, because once this is trained, there's no parameters. Uh, the only thing, of course, is that uh, uh, what is essential here, that you, you need to have good training data, and your, the data that you applied on needs to look like your training data. And probably the, the more data you have, the better this gets. So you can train it to, uh, to also pick through noise if you add synthetic noise to your, uh, your, your training data. Uh, so, so that is a nice, uh, nice feature, and it's also interesting to look inside these layers. So, as I said before, this is a this is a unit. Um, the details of it have been published, but it's not very exciting. It's a standard thing. And um, what you can do is you can sort of visualize the the result uh, of of pushing an input gather or. A, a section of data through the network, and then you sort of see what the various uh, filters or, or sequences of filters and layers do to the image. So you can see it's it's a it's a very uh, it's of course a very nonlinear data decomposition where it decomposes the data into what it thinks are uh, suitable building blocks. 
And then based on what you have put on the right hand side, it, it will decide, okay, uh, some of these building blocks are, are not really essential. For instance, this big vertical stripe of noise, it's not really because it's not in my, my label. So there's no, you know, you don't see that back in, in, in the red zone, which is what we wanted to predict. And then when it decomposes that image and recombines it again, you see that it, it sort of inherently has denoised the data before it makes uh, its predictions. So this also means you can use it for denoising, and, and this is why certain denoising applications will certainly be uh, successful. Another interesting um, aspect we found is that uh, we, we gave it something like 30,000 shots, uh, and, and we applied one of our first break pickers uh, to generate labels or the, or the, the, the truth, so you will. And uh, there were some errors in these labels, some mispicks. Uh, and we found that the neural network was not able to reproduce these mispicks. If, if it would have, we would have been in a situation where we had uh, overfitting. But it, it, it managed to uh, weed out uh, the errors. So basically, the, it, in the end, the neural network was better than our, our trained data. Sorry, our, our, uh, our training labels. So this also means you could, for instance, just run your conventional operation and, and train and apply a neural network afterwards to just have sort of an automatic um, improvement of your result, which is also a nice feature. It's not perfect all the time. For instance, this is an application to an OBN data set that was not used in the training. Uh, we did not have first break picks here, but it, it did a reasonable job in sort of picking like an, maybe like an envelope through some of the noises here and it follows the outline so you could you could already use this as to help you, for instance, uh, get you a quick mute. But here it, it completely fails because none of this strong noise was present in the training data. So this is where we have maybe a law of preservation of uh, misery of effort. So you know, okay, maybe this algorithm is really easy to run, but we need to spend a lot of time getting it the right data to train. Otherwise, we end up uh, in the same in the same boat again. Okay, so the next example is on uh, noise attenuation. So we, as I alluded to before, from looking into a convolutional neural network, you could already see some hints of that it could be used for uh, denoising. And now we also use a supervised learning approach where it's, it's not a, a unit, but a simple, uh, well, not simple, it's, it's, a, it's a convolutional neural network with several layers. Uh, I think uh, this was eight or nine layers deep. And it's a typical choice of filter settings. I think it's, they're mentioned on the next slide. And it's supervised because you have to give it a, um, a noise-free example. So this is, so then it trains the neural network to, uh, to turn this noisy shot into the clean shot. In this case, this was fairly easy because all this noise, it, it's, it's supposed to represent blended shot noise. Uh, from a simultaneous source acquisition, and the, the noise was actually computer generated from a, from a similar shot. Um, so yeah, then um, the way this was done is is by dividing the data up into various patches, um, and then we can. So for instance, here it's done with uh, 48 by 48 patches, and then we have. Uh, a CNN with 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 ResNet with batch norm with you know the filter sizes as it's mentioned here and it's fully convolutional. And then uh, basically what you want to do is is train the blocks on the right to to become the blocks on the right. Uh, sorry, the, the blocks on the left will have to be mapped or transformed into the blocks on the right, and um, you end up with a neural network that is capable of that. And then what happens inside the neural network? It, it again does like this data decomposition and it, it probably puts to zero all these uh, filters or layers where the vertical stripes or the blending noise comes out as, a, as, a, as the key signal. So this was work done by Rolf Bartman and that was also uh, published in uh, EAG abstract and in, uh, in a journal paper. So here you see um, a, a, a large seismic gather. So the input, the output, and the difference. And what is really, to, in, in my interpretation and experience, it's amazing that this is an algorithm that has no parameters and it produces 
almost a uh, signal leakage free result. So this is like a seismic processor's dream to have something like that, right? It's just a sort of uh, I feel lucky button for noise attenuation. Right, so again, this meets the criteria that it's fast, good, and uh, simple. So the last uh, ex example that we have today is on uh, inversion. So this is a bit more uh, more out there, more and more experimental, so to say, is where we, yeah, we basically want to uh, estimate uh, velocities from seismic records. So this is a bit more difficult. So this is not pure image processing. Um, this is really getting into re inversion, seismic inversion. Uh, so I focused here on getting the near service velocity from seismic getters. Uh, I've not, so there's other authors out there that have focused on getting, uh, for instance, interval velocities or stacking velocities uh, from getters and, and with good success. Um, and the reason why we would do it is because it would be somewhere in between maybe like a dispersion curve approach and, and a full 3D acoustic or elastic FWI, which, which takes some time and some pre-processing. And uh, this could be in the middle and it might provide a useful starting model for a more advanced model-based method. So I'm not thinking this is going to replace the model-based inversion, but it could help it make it better. Um, we use the SEG uh, ARID model for this. So the nice thing here is that we have a very densely sampled uh, data set and we have, of course, uh, the Earth model, which is kind of uh, important if you want to do this with supervised learning. And then we focus on the top 200 meters. And I made a split between training and testing data uh, based on location in the model. So I have, I have the, the top part of the models for training and the bottom part for testing. And they're similar, but somewhat different because we have this high velocity outcrop here in the in the basically the south of this model that is not present in the training data. So there's there's two ways to do that. I will discuss both. Um, well I guess there's more but I've done just two. The one is where we take the data, uh, transform it to the phase velocity um, frequency spectrum and then have a neural network map that picture into a, a 1D column of numbers. So yeah, I think this is really how you should see it because there's no physics in it. There's nothing here that links wave. There's nothing like a wave equation in here. Is it just I want to transform this 2D image into this 1D vector of, of values? And the neural network can do that. Um, I, I think it's not super critical what kind of the neural networks you choose. There's there's many kinds of flavors you could have, and they all probably would do a good job. Uh, you could easily make uh, 10 different conference abstracts with 10 different neural networks, uh, and I'm sure we'll, we'll see something like that happening. But uh, as you can see uh, here on, on the right-hand side, the, the red is the um, prediction, and the, the black line is, is the true uh, 1D velocity profile along that line. So this is not surprising, because I think you can always train a network to, to map uh, one set of numbers into another set of numbers. The question is really, like, how does it generalize? Uh, another thing I, I need to comment on uh, is that uh, the reason I went to this frequency velocity spectrum is uh, because there's no thing, nothing like a wave equation or something in there, there's no sense of coordinates or, or dimension. So if I train my data to, um, uh, to, to have as input four seconds of data and 3,000 meters of offset, then when I run it on another data set, that also needs to have those same same dimensions. Otherwise, uh, funny things might happen. So by going to another domain, um, you, you kind of sidestep that a bit. We could always uh, transform the data or resample data set such that it meets, uh, for instance, the frequency range or, or the dip range. Um, yeah, and of course, there's, there is some problem where if your sampling is different from your training data, you might end up with a gap in the in this phase velocity diagram. Um, so on the previous example, the, the trace spacing was, uh, I think, six meters, and here it's uh, 15 meters. So um, this is just an effect of, of that. Um, right, so here we are after getting the 1D velocity or the 1D shear wave profile really from this image with, uh, with radio waves and I guess it um, ignores uh, all, all the guided waves. So the nice thing is, uh, yeah, that actually works. 
Uh, it also works on the, on the testing data as provided the testing data looks like the training data. That, that's well known. So when I apply this to a line of synthetic data, uh, I get the results that is shown here uh, with the true and the predicted. It's of course not, not perfect, but it's, it's pretty good and this would serve very nicely as a, as a starting model for something else. Um, and then here's another example. And of course, when you go to a different part of the country or the world, then yeah, if your, your actual velocity in the near surface doesn't look like the one that you used in your training data, this is also not going to work. So you need to always have some sort of like boundary with, uh, of your velocity, or you need to have a notional idea of the velocity profile, and then you can do a modeling exercise, and then you can train a network. So it's, it's a bit involved, but, um, if you do all that, I'm, I'm confident that it will work. The other thing, um, you keep an eye on the time here. The other thing is that um, you can also go full crazy and just map that input shot gather into a 2D representation of the Earth, or like a, yeah, a 2D model. Here I've actually used the same neural network. And um, yeah, so to my surprise, this actually produced decent results. Um, again, you lose the high frequencies, but on the low, you know, on the core scale, this actually works. Um, and then if you apply it to the training data, it's, it's sort of, yeah, if you squint your eyes a bit, this, this is not a bad result at all. But of course, it's very tuned to this training data. And, and part of me is a bit skeptical and thinks, okay, what if I just replace uh, the model with uh, cat photos? Uh, then it probably also would work. So I'm not uh, confident that this is... Uh, well, I remain skeptical until I've seen one. Let me put it like that. Okay, um, um, let's now uh, wrap up a bit. So we have these uh, traditional methods that we're all familiar with for QC parameter selection, uh, which I only talked about but have no results on. Uh, signal processing methods, wave equation methods, and, and all this data should really like obey the model, it should be described by the physics and the equations of the model. And if, if that's not the case, then we struggle. We know that, right? We can do uh, acoustic FWI when we have ground roll in the data, or we cannot uh, do surface wave, or we cannot do good multiple attenuation in, with surface wave multiple attenuation if there's internal multiple, stuff like that. So just replacing everything with AI methods you know, means we won't suffer from some of the old problems, but instead we get some new problems, right? The statistics of the uh, data needs to be the same, image sizes, uh, yeah, the, the training data must be like the data where you apply it on. And also here, you know, if the events are not present in your training data, then you're gonna get some surprises. So maybe it's just a, uh, it's not a complete new thing that will solve all problems. It will just solve some and give us new problems. Um, so what I think is the potential impact for AI in seismic processing is more uh, surgical. For a certain application, it will do wonders. For others, it won't. Uh, anything that's like vision-based QC picking, it will work. Anything that's signal processing and involving filters and convolutions, it will work. And for inversion, yeah, well, if you probably have enough training data, you can do some surprising things, but you need to uh, be careful. Okay, um, I am almost finished. Um, I thought it was, would be nice to share, share this with you. So I was in the uh, selection panel for the uh, EAG uh, annual conference this year, and um, we looked at uh, this particular session on digitalization and AI. So there was one session which had 123 submissions, which was actually quite a lot. Um, and what we what you see is that most of the work is done in uh, reservoir characterization and interpretation, uh, and there's there's less or little or done in actual seismic data processing. Uh, and there's most of the work is done in velocity analysis uh, and some denoising and perspective picking. So I guess time will tell uh, which of these applications will um, will survive and be actually useful and which of those were just, okay, that is interesting and was a nice abstract, but it doesn't add any business value. I think uh, many of them will not survive, but I think we'll, we'll end up with actually uh, some uh, useful tools in the toolbox. 
Okay, in the end, I think we'll end up with, uh, yeah, we don't have to worry about AI will will beat us in our work and it will replace us, but it will just, um, it will free some of our time up for, uh, for more complicated things and we can have the, the, the computer um, solve some of the things that are now still very time consuming and, and cumbersome, like QCing and, and, and picking and, and parameterization and stuff like that. Okay, uh, this should really be the last slide. So I have uh, talked about two possible applications of AI in seismic data processing. One is where we keep all our old algorithms and just use it for parameter estimation and control. And, and there's lots of work to be done there still. That's all machine vision based in my opinion. And then the other one is where, yeah, that's really uh, the low hanging fruit where we actually do uh, data processing with, for instance, neural networks or machine learning. Okay, um, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Paul. This was a very informative and nice presentation. So the second presenter is uh, Norbert Dolle. Uh, he is the co-founder of uh, White Space Energy, and uh, he he. He's working with the, uh, this company uh, after spending close to 20 years in Shell in various technical and uh, leadership roles across the globe. Uh, Norbert is saying that he's driven by a strong passion for efficiency and simplicity, uh, which is reflected in the mission of White Space Energy, which is to redefine complex decision-making in oil and gas using the latest uh, AI. Uh, Norbert, he stays uh, grounded in reality by his two daughters of three and six years old and the joins training for and participating in triathlons. So Norbert, I give you the talk. Thank you, Diego. Edward, yeah, thank you. I pull my slides. I think you can see my slides even when I go into mode. Uh, yeah, thank you, Diego. Thank you for this uh, opportunity to present to such a big audience. Uh, yeah, my name is Norbert Dolle. I'm managing partner of White Space Energy. We started this company in March 2019 with a few actual Shell colleagues. Uh, but I obviously don't want to make this presentation about White Space Energy. What I want to do is uh, is to trigger your imagination about what is possible when you think out of the box when you have the white space to really think and innovate. And that's something we've been trying to do running our own company. One of our frustrations uh, when we still worked in the industry in, in an operator was around decision making, which is often uh, very slow, uh, very iterative and very opinion dominated. So we decided to focus uh, our company's mission on transforming that complex decision making using uh, artificial intelligence. And that's the topic of this, uh, of this presentation. So there's uh, complex decisions, as you all know, right across the value chain in, in oil and gas from, let's say, field development planning, well planning, project execution, portfolio planning, maintenance, logistics, all the way down to, to decommissioning. Uh, I, will show, I will show two examples later on on how we address these as, a, as an example. But what all these decisions have in common is that there's often a very large number of choices or options to choose from, a very wide ranges of risks and uncertainties, and there's almost always uh, competing business drivers such as safety, production, and cost. And these elements make it extremely difficult to make good quality decisions in, a, in, a, in a, an often time-constrained fashion. But when you uh, take a step back, then complex decisions are really nothing more than uh, moves in a complex game. When you play a game of chess, every move in a game of chess is also a complex decision where you have an awful lot of different options and choices uh, there's risks, there's an opponent to anticipate. You can play it safe or you can play it a bit more risky. So complex decisions, and I think that's the key thing to take away from this slide, are very similar to moves in a complex game such as chess. But when you then think about artificial intelligence and you look at what companies like IBM, Google, and Facebook uh, have been doing and are doing, is that they, they use games to develop artificial intelligence algorithms. Uh, many of you will, will remember that IBM had a, a supercomputer called Deep Blue that played chess against the Russian world champion about uh, well, slightly more than 20 years ago. 
but really in recent years, in the last decade or so, uh, this development of artificial intelligence using games has really accelerated, and there's a few examples shown on this on this uh, timeline. Um, one key uh, change during this last decade is that the algorithms have changed significantly, whereas IBM in Deep Blue used very classical machine learning, so there was a very powerful computer that learned how to play chess by just ingesting millions of different historical gameplays, and it learned from that, and by, through its sheer computer power, it beat Garry Kasparov, essentially. It wasn't that intelligent, it just had an awful lot of uh, computer power. But really, since 2017 or so, when Google developed uh, AlphaGo Zero, Go is an Asian board game with a lot of different combinations, often seen until that time as the biggest challenge for AI, uh, these algorithms have changed. So they developed uh, what we call reinforcement learning algorithms that learn how to play a game through self-play. So they no, no longer need all these historical gameplays, but they're being uh, told what the rules of the game are and through self-play of thousands, hundreds of thousands or sometimes millions amount of playing these games, they learn what a good move is and what a bad move is and they learn how to develop winning strategies. Uh, I've got a simple example here uh, of a, a movie from a Google-owned company called DeepMind. And some of you who are a bit older may have played Atari games in the past, but this is a, an Atari game called Breakout. And the very simple objective of this game is to bounce back the ball and uh, eat up some of the, the blocks that are giving you points. Um, so they, Deep, DeepMind played this game, or they, teach, they taught an AI agent how to play this game by just teaching it the rules of the game, i.e. you need to bounce back the ball to eat up the blocks. And you see that over time in this movie, you see that it, over time it develops the intelligence how to play this game extremely well. So initially, after a few gameplays and training sets, it's still very stupid. Uh, it's You probably play this better yourself. But over time, it gets better and better. And this is after two hours of training. It probably plays like one of the best uh, humans already. Certainly better than I would be able to play it with. So that's very powerful. You don't you you don't need to train an agent or an artificial intelligence algorithm based on the historical gameplay, but you train it just by teaching it the rules and allowing it to play. And then after here four hours of training, it starts to uh, find a breakthrough and, and find a, a strategy that, as a human, we probably wouldn't have uh, immediately thought of. Certainly not after four hours. This is, pretty, this is a pretty efficient way of eating up all these blocks. So this is what they call superhuman performance. The algorithm comes up with uh, strategies that you would not have immediately thought of as a human. Now, when we think about oil and gas decisions, many of these are actually equally or sometimes more complex than the games that I showed you on the timeline. So take a game of chess. The game of chess has uh, 10 to the power 50 different board combinations. So you can imagine that it is indeed quite difficult to become really a master at playing chess. But if you take a simple uh, maintenance problem, a problem in which you have to sequence, let's say, 80, 80 different activities in a certain order, and many of you can already calculate what the number of permutations is, but that's significantly more than the number of, of, uh, of uh, board positions in a game of chess. And this is a game that uh, maintenance planners are playing every day, and actually they're not planning 80 activities. Some Some of them are dealing with hundreds or thousands of activities on, a, on an annual basis. So very complex games with very high stakes as well. So you can imagine that the company spends tens to hundreds of millions of, of uh, euros on their annual maintenance. If you don't execute your maintenance very well, then you've got risks in terms of safety, in terms of production performance. Now, uh, I've just shown you how complex the decisions are that we often have in, in our industry. Yet when you compare the approach to our problems, that's significantly different from how we address these complex games. So these games played by Facebook and by Google and by IBM, they use algorithms such as tree searches, uh, operations research, genetic algorithms, or this deep reinforcement learning. Very often they use combinations of the various algorithms. Uh, and if you think about how we play these similar and sometimes more complex oil and gas games, we use Excel and we use a lot of gut feel and we use a lot of experience. So you can imagine that there's an awful lot of value left on the table. 
So if we would use the same uh, approach as we would use for complex game, then we can achieve a much deeper insight. So that's what we uh, try to do, and that's what I'll show you later on. You take a complex decision, you pair that up with uh, the latest game artificial intelligence or the same approach, which gives you uh, a very deep insight in a limited amount of time. Uh, this is just this, uh, a different slide to describe the same approach. So what we do is we take a business decision, we translate that into a game, a game with certain rules, constraints, and a game with a scoring system that reflects what you find important or what you may not find important at all. We pair that up with a, a bespoke AI algorithm, often taken from open source, but then modified to play this particular game. We allow the AI assistant, as we call it, to play this game uh, lots of times and to develop different policies. And these policies are then being displayed in uh, a dashboard that translates the policy into certain KPIs. And with that dashboard and planners, decision makers, domain experts can use that to facilitate decisions. So we, we, we never um, think of AI as giving us the answer. We think of AI as an assistant to decision makers to give us full insight into that option space that is so wide and, uh, and large. Uh, I've got two examples. One is uh, which uh, to a community like yours is probably most relevant is called well trajectory planning. Many of you have been involved in planning new wells. And if you have been involved, in most companies actually well trajectory planning is a, it can be a quite a frustrating process. It's often very iterative, it's very time consuming. And why, why is that? There's uh, many different disciplines involved. So from subsurface to wells and completions, there's a decision maker, there's often somebody who, who understands the facilities or where the slots are and how that connects. So there's all these different opinions. Most of these different disciplines use their own language, uh, their own terminology, they use their own models. And that becomes a very iterative way of working through a well trajectory planning problem. And that's why after a couple of weeks of, uh, of trying to plan wells, there's often only a handful of options knowing that there are many, many more options, but you just don't have time to analyze all of those. Now we see well trajectory planning uh, as something similar to a game like Pac-Man, right? So in Pac-Man, there are things that you like. Uh, there's uh, bits to avoid. You need to steer the Pac-Man through the game board, and there are certain rules about that. Uh, there's nothing uh, different from steering a drill bit or planning a drill bit through the subsurface. There's things that you like, remaining oil and gas, for example. There's things that you don't like, geohazards, faults, other wells that you can't collide into. And then there's obviously movement rules that have been defined by well engineers and by, uh, by uh, a long history of drilling in a certain asset, certain dog legs that you uh, can accept, certain azimuths, certain casing setting points that you want to adhere to. So there's all these rules, and these are not that different from a game like Pac-Man. Uh, this is uh, showing you a similar movie of some work we've done recently uh, with an Equino data set. Uh, and I just want you to compare this with the breakout movie that I showed you from uh, DeepMind. So this is an agent that has been told the rules of the game of well trajectory planning. So what are feasible dog legs, what are azimuths and inclinations that you can achieve. There's uh, two targets here. You see with the, the, the green stars, there's a, a target entry and a target a total depth target. And the aim of the game for the agent is to design a well that adheres to the rules, that is feasible to drill, that goes through these targets, avoiding all the other wells in, in this uh, very uh, complex and congested asset, as you can see. So initially, it goes pretty wacky. And after a number of gameplays, it learns how to nicely land as well horizontally with dog legs that are feasible to drill. Now, if you want, if you have this, if you have a self-learning agent that can design well trajectories, then you can obviously bring in obstacles like a shallow gas uh, hazard. You could do multiple targets simultaneously. So just as an example of how you can use similar AI as being used in games or in self-driving cars for that matter, to start helping you uh, design well trajectories. Now then, this is again an example of, of work we've done with Equinor. Then uh, through this gameplay, you can have lots of different combinations that have been explored by the AI algorithm. And obviously, as a user, you cannot uh, just take thousands of well trajectories and analyze those quickly. So we present these in a dashboard uh, that allows users and decision makers 
to zoom in on the type of well they like most. Some people like risky wells, but that risky well may have an awful lot of value. Other uh, decision makers or well engineers may like very safe wells, thereby trading off some of the potential ultimate recovery that they are going to get from that well. So this is just, just an example of, of how we do this. Uh, this is a second use case of well trajectory planning. Uh, and this is uh, done, we're done for petroleum development Oman, an onshore field, um, brownfield. So very congested. There's about 300 plus wells already, as you see to the left. So again, a spaghetti of well trajectories that you uh, want to avoid when you plan new wells. There's also limited options at surface in this case, even though it's in the middle of the desert. But there's uh, quite a large number of well pads already. There's roads, there's overhead electricity lines, there's pipelines, there's underground cables. All of these kind of things need to be taken into account with a certain safety factor to plan your new well pads. And the question they had is, you know, if you're going to do this manually, it's going to take forever. Uh, so how can we use uh, artificial intelligence to design and optimize an info development of another 100 wells or so in this, in this field? And again, we used a similar uh, approach as I showed you before on the work with Equinor, which kind of automatically screens the options of combining a feasible well pad in a certain location with a subsurface target. In a matter of hours, we just screen the whole field for feasible well trajectories, whereas otherwise this would take certainly months or, or probably longer for a full team. Um, so that's well trajectory planning. Uh, really, on the other end of the spectrum is maintenance. I gave you some insights in how complex a maintenance problem can be when you have to sequence a number of activities in a certain certain order. Um, this is a, a case we did for a Southern North Sea gas operator. They uh, had a problem with, so the scale of the problem is they had a portfolio of about 9,000 work activities or work scopes. Um, their asset has uh, about 30 normally unmanned installations in the shallow uh, North Sea. Mm, a single workboat that transports a maintenance crew of about 40 people to these platforms. Uh, but their problem was they saw a very poorly used uh, crew. So the, the crew was only used about 60% of the time. And as a result, they saw maintenance backlog building up over the, over the last few years. And they asked us, what can we do to better plan this work, to better plan where the boat is going, and what work is ex executed, to use our crew more efficiently and thereby reducing the backlog and reducing our safety exposure and our production exposure. So what we did is we translated this planning uh, process into a pretty simple game. So uh, an artificial intelligent game player just needs to decide where to take the boat, what activities it's going to do on that location, and how long it stays there before it moves to the next location. And with these simple rules, we allow that agent to play uh, the game thousands and thousands of times on this same portfolio of 9,000 work activities and to come up with a certain schedule for the boat and on each location which activities to execute. And then we present these results in a dashboard that looks something like this in a, in a very simplified uh, manner. On the top, you see some key uh, performance indicators for a maintenance plan. Let's say the percentage of safety critical scope completed, the total number of work orders in backlog, production at risk, you see a vessel timeline. And towards the left, you see uh, one of the most important things is these different opinions. These opinions are translated into a scoring system. And by toggling these opinions, you can say, I, I find process safety important. Give me an optimized plan uh, for process safety. And the AI agent can come up with a plan that uh, executes all of the safety critical scope but obviously at the expense of the production at risk or the total number of work orders done. You can also say, I find reducing backlog the most important thing. In that case, you can execute as, as much work orders as, as you can possibly fit into a schedule, but obviously at the expense of safety critical scope. So this gives uh, decision makers and planners uh, a much better tool to plan uh, the work with a, a kind of a, a quantified opinions rather than a very opinionated, non-quantified decision-making process. I'm almost at the end. Um, I've shown you two examples of complex decisions, but they're really across the value chain. Again, from field development to well planning, logistics, maintenance, portfolio planning. So how do you plan an optimum portfolio of capital projects? 
to turnarounds, to rig sequencing, to decommissioning, name, you name it. And, and obviously you can think about uh, quite a few examples yourself in and outside of the industry as well. But the key takeaway is that uh, we often address these problems with very outdated tools, a very outdated approach. As an in, and, and as an industry, we can do so much better in supporting these decisions. When we think out of the box, when we, when we take the time to, to innovate. I just want to leave you with this last quote. This is a quote by the European champion of Go. And he used AlphaGo, the DeepMind, the algorithm developed by DeepMind, to train himself, to teach himself how to become a better player. And as a result, his, his world ranking skyrocketed. So you can imagine if this, uh, this is what AI can do to help a European champion, a pretty masterful player already, then what it can do to oil and gas organizations in making better decisions. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Norbert, for your presentation. Uh, very, very interesting. <clears throat> so before concluding, uh, I want to do some uh, acknowledgements. Uh, so of course, uh, I, I want to thank uh, Paul and Norbert for the interesting talks and uh, also for the answer to the question of the attendees. Uh, I want to thank uh, Aramco Versi Company for providing the WebEx event platform and uh, uh, Edelbert for helping uh, to set up the virtual meeting and also assist us uh, tonight. I want to thank EAG and the local chapter of uh, Aberdeen, London, Netherlands, Oslo and Paris for their participation. And of course, all of you for your attention. So after this, I think we can uh, close the event. Thank you again.